Hey folks, I'm Papa Boris, and we're going to do something a little bit different for this video. I've played with each of the six altered starter decks available in the beta on Board Game Arena. I think of these six games, the best was the game I played with Izmir. I lost that one because my opponent really knew what they were doing. The other five games, I feel like, were all against opponents who were just kind of learning the ropes and hadn't quite figured things out yet. So for this video, I wanted to do something a little bit different. I wanted to go through a replay of a game I had played previously against a very strong opponent that illustrates one of the reasons that I'm very excited about this TCG. I think that Altered makes your brain twist in ways that I haven't experienced before playing many, many, many other TCGs. There's some novelty here, not just in that the mechanics are different, but the way that you have to think about certain concepts is very different. And in this playthrough, when I'm going to do a general, you know, in-depth analysis, I'd like you also to pay attention to the way that we have to think about card advantage. So for this game, I was playing a lot of Ortis because I noticed that this was the least popularly chosen faction in my statistically insignificant anecdotal sample size. I've only ever had one opponent pick this faction, which is strange because it's the simplest one in, 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 in my opinion. You just get a free 1-1, one, one, right? Like that's good and simple and consistent. So I picked it and my opponent here went with Muna, the Druid, which we just saw. That was my last video. And it's a very, very strong faction and a pretty strong hero. Now, my opening hand was both good and bad. It featured some of the quintessential Ortis cards. So we got the Ortis Carrier to generate free recruits. You got Joan of Arc, who, when she leaves, drops some recruits on the table. And then you follow that up with a charge for just tons of recruits, all getting plus one. And those are the cards that I kept. I don't necessarily think it's a good idea to keep this like mid-game combo, but what else was I going to keep? This thing I think you can pretty much always just toss. It's extremely limited. It's uh, paying three mana to get rid of a character or a permanent with hand cost four or more. And a lot of times you're just not going to see those. And then this thing only works if you control three or more other characters which you know you, you kind of aren't going to get until the mid game this is not like a turn one or a turn two play so i picked my cards to get rid of as mana oh yeah i'm not going to keep two of these so we kept one of these for the first turn and then this for later or possibly discarding as mana if i got better early game draws so it did mean i was kind of playing uh face up here in a sense because um you know i could just i just had to play this carrier that's my that's my turn one play beg your pardon folks i need to see if i can adjust things so i can see the controls the replay controls eh, okay i guess we're just gonna have to scroll up and down a fair bit so my opponent plays the classic sneezer shroom however this is a rare version of the card and i had not seen this before so i didn't realize it had this extra rare text no comp no like drawbacks it's it's the exact same card just with an added bonus of at noon i get one boost so the round you play it assuming you get muna's or sorry Tage's ability it's a two 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 that's what got anchored. And then the next round, it get, becomes a 3-3-3. Three, three, three. So there's just a free 3-3-3 three, 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 three sitting on the board. And then the anchored battle cry works from the reserve too. So then it comes out of the reserve, gains anchored, gains the bonus. And then the next round is a 3-3-3. Three, three, three. So there's just four rounds of torture with this stupid sneezer. So my opponent must have been very happy because not only do they move, and I don't move since I spent my move playing this slow thing, meaning they got to have a move with a 2-2-2, two, two, two. Um, but also they got this immense value the following round. So now, uh, when, when my hero power spawns a token, that token is going to look kind of dumb compared to the sneezer. Now, I made a crucial mistake here. I got this spy that lets you get rid of cards from reserve and Joan of Arc. Now, am I going to play two Joan of Arcs? Probably not. And even if I were, I wouldn't want to keep that right now in the second round of the game. So I should have put one of these in the mana and kept this to get rid of the damn Sneezer Shroom when it's sitting in reserve. But I didn't realize what was happening with this situation. So I discarded my spy for mana. Leaving two Joan of Arcs that I was not going to play. Spoiler alert, I was going to end up discarding one of them to mana the following turn. So I get my tokens out. My opponent puts down this thing. So they're going to be able to anchor something later on. And also with the hero power of getting a boost, it's actually pretty good stats for three mana. 
on my turn, I don't really have anything to do. Charge doesn't do anything, so even though it's not the strongest play, I drop down Joan of Arc, because I literally have nothing else to do. So at least I get to tie this Sneezer. Note though, if it wasn't the rare version, I would actually beat it, and I would move and my opponent wouldn't. Instead, neither of us moves, and my opponent moves over here. So coming off of round two, my opponent has moved twice, I've moved zero times, and my opponent still has some of this uh, latent value sitting around. They can replay their Sneezer, and they can also re-anchor it. But also, on the third round, I do get two tokens from Joan of Arc, and I'm going to get another from my Hero Power and another from the Landmark. So it's not like I've got no horse in this race, although I am two steps behind. My opponent discards a card for mana. I look at my hand. I got the special Joan of Arc. She costs more, but she drops two tokens upon death rather than one in each lane. So I threw away the other Joan of Arc to mana. And on this turn, the question is, do I play Joan of Arc? And because I'm already two steps behind, making such a weak play, a 2-2 two -two for 5, just for future value, seemed a little bit ex excessive. So what I decided to do was play my little Frog Prince here. Luckily... My opponent needed exactly water and forest here. They couldn't get through with a desert. So this was kind of a perfect card, and I got lucky in that regard. The zero desert is irrelevant in this case. My opponent put back Ebenezer Sneezer, and at this point, I played charge. So I'm not going to wait for Joan to play charge, even though that's the combo. I need to get a move on. <coughs> and make some progress in my lanes. This does mean that the following turn, I don't have any extra advantages, so I didn't play Joan of Arc, but I felt like playing Joan of Arc was just a little bit too optimistic. Now my opponent here makes an interesting play. They decided to play another Sneezer Shroom. In my opinion, what my opponent should have done here instead of playing this Shroom was actually play out the Muna Druid for going its reserve ability into this lane. The reason for that is that she has three forest, and... Um, two of the other two stats, with, which combined with the Sneezer Shroom would have put her at six forest and five of the other two. Notice that actually beats me on everything, and it gives her enough water to move. So she would have moved and I wouldn't have. As it is, I move and she doesn't. That's a swing of two spaces. In my opinion in this game, if you have a chance to move one space for a card, it's worth taking. This was not a one-move swing. This would have been a two-move swing. So I think that... Um, oh, hang on a second. I'm sorry. I'm incorrect. Hold on. I, I'm discounting the 1-1-1 one, one, one of the Sneezer Shroom. I beg your pardon. So she would not have moved. My opponent would have stopped me from moving. So she would have, compared to this Sneezer Shroom, gained two forest and one of the others. So she would have beaten me on forest. She would have tied me on the others. She needs water, which is unlucky, not forest. So she wouldn't have moved herself, but I wouldn't have moved either. But by not playing the Muna Druid, she allows me to move. So it is only a one-move swing, not a two-move swing, but I think it's worth it. I think it's playing a card to get a one-move swing is worth it. Now you might say, well, hang on, Papa Boris. My opponent, instead of doing that, gets to play these two cards for future value. She's got these two anchored cards, so the next turn she's going to be starting with all this stuff on the board for free value. Put a pin in that. We're going to see later on why this is not a good idea, even though it looks like you're getting a lot of future value out of it. If you want to pause the video and try to solve a puzzle, like, well, what is exactly wrong with this, other than the fact that it forfeits the ability uh, to prevent me from moving, feel free to do so now. We'll return to that later. For now, my opponent passes. I don't have a one drop, so I don't do anything. I get to move because my opponent let me. Over here, I was going to move no matter what, so now I'm caught up. But now it's another case of this game being a big swingling, where previous turn I had these starting advantages and my opponent didn't. Now my opponent has this massive amount of stats in the hero side, whereas I have nothing anywhere except for, of course, my two free tokens, one from my hero power and one from the landmark. Over here, I didn't really think this was going to do enough, so I threw it away for mana. I get my tokens. And we're off. So my opponent decides to play Inari. Just a 3-1-3, three, three, which of course becomes a 4-2-4 four, four with the hero ability. And I decide, you know what? It's time. Let's bring out the Frog Prince. 
it's again really lucky the desert doesn't matter both of us are in a place where desert doesn't make any difference and this actually allows me to time my opponent on the key stats so now my opponent would have to do something over here in order to make progress and they would either have to play this moon and druid over here to try to win it or and which means that they forfeit the anchoring ability or they would need to play some kind of card from their hand and that might potentially give me the opportunity to play this and steal the hero lane. So now I have three characters and I can play Kakoba here as four stats, which would squeak through the win on water. Now, obviously, instead of playing the Frog Prince, I could have played Joan of Arc, but the problem is that um, if I play Joan of Arc first, I'm committing four mana. If things go really haywire and there's just like nothing I can do anywhere, I could just throw out Joan of Arc with my remaining four mana and then get the tokens for the next round. But I didn't want to lead with that. And I also didn't want to lead with this Joan of Arc because if I play her, then I can't play anything else because she costs five. So I think Frog Prince here, I stand by this play. My opponent decides to use this to give Anchored to this Sneezer Shroom, which means that the following turn is going to get another plus one, plus one, plus one and stick around. So that's just incredible value from this sneezer shroom you could argue maybe she should have just put anchored on this even though it's not like getting a plus one plus one um it's got really good stats over here in this lane but notice that after the sneezer goes up it becomes a four 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 whereas this is only a four two four so this is one reason why i think my opponent's a pretty strong player they clearly understand what they're doing and they're making strategic choices I would note, however, that maybe it would have been better just to play this over here and actually advance in this lane instead of constantly pushing for future value. My opponent then plays Nurture, buffing up their deity over here, contesting this lane, and of course also buffing up their ridiculous Sneezer Shroom. So now <clears throat> I'm in a pretty bad spot, and I decided to say, just let's play, let's play, let's play Joan of Arc. I could have played this... But at this point, they have so many stats here that even 4-4-4 um, uh, four, four, four across the board would have made no difference. Um, it would have stopped them from moving because they require water, but it wouldn't have moved me. And spending the rest of my mana just to produce a stalemate seems kind of weak. So I decided to just play Joan of Arc over here. I'm squeaking through on the water. Obviously, my opponent can stop it by playing Nurture. But then what happens is that my opponent moves in one lane. We tie in this lane because desert does not move and them beating me on desert with the plus one from nurture doesn't let them move and then i get the tokens so i felt like it was better to do that and get tokens than to play this and tie and then get nothing in the future and here is where my opponent made an error they either just forgot that they could play nurture which is very unusual in a trading card game that you can play a spell and then you can immediately play it again in the same round that's just not something you can do. Like in Hearthstone, Magic, basically any game, you play a spell, it goes away. So my opponent might have forgotten that this was here. Now, if they didn't forget that it was here and they chose not to play it, allowing me to move instead of playing this just to stop me from moving, I think it's a mistake for two reasons. One reason is that I generally think it's worth playing a card to affect movement because you only need seven movements to win the game. So either stopping your opponent from moving or making sure that you yourself move, I think is worth a card. But the other reason is, watch what happens after my opponent passes. I pass, I have no mana, <clears throat> and then <clears throat> my opponent moves here, I move here because they let me, and look at the reserve fill up. This was the problem, in my opinion, with my opponent playing these anchored cards last turn to build up board advantage for this turn. Yeah, they stick around, but then the following turn, they fall into the reserve along with anything my opponent played that round, and then my opponent ends up having to just throw cards away. And this is one of the fascinating things for me with Altered, is that this reserve with the two limit just messes with your head. You have to realize that card advantage isn't any longer just what you're holding in your hand, it's also what you have in your reserve. It's the sum of your hand and the reserve. And having to throw cards away from the reserve is just the same as in Magic the Gathering if you discard cards from your hand or in Hearthstone if you fall behind cards in your hand. So I think this is where my opponent, despite being a pretty strong player of trading card games generally, 
just hadn't quite caught up to the kind of flexing the brain requires in Altered. They just didn't really take into account how many cards they would be throwing away from their reserve. And this is another reason why they should have played Nurture with their last mana, is now, uh, if they, this weren't here, they would be throwing away one fewer card. And, like, they could have thrown this away, wouldn't have been a huge deal. As it is, they threw away that one and this Inari, which could have had really relevant stats. A 3-1-3 three, three for 2 is really good stats. Remember, it's coming out of the reserve, so it's the lower cost, plus, of course, this hero power. So my opponent lost an immense amount of value at a point in the game when a 3-1-2 for 3, or sorry, 3-1-3 for 2 would have been really relevant. Anyway, um, I drew this thing, so I was happy to throw that in for mana because I'm pretty much never going to use it. I don't even know if this deck has anything I would target with it. And it was time for my opponent, or sorry, time for the new day to start, and then I would be the first player here. So I am behind. My opponent has friggin' 555 over here in this lane, so this is going to be hard to make movement in. Though I do have a way to possibly steal it with this, because um, which because I, I start with four tokens, which means this thing is online. It is a 555 for three. But um, committing that right away feels a little... Oh, sorry. I, I have a rare version of this that I drew, and then I have the normal version of this. So the question is, do I play both of them, or do I just play Joan? And then if I do play both of them, which one do I play first and where do I play it? I decided not to play Joan because that would be the only thing I'm playing this round. And I decided to play the weaker one over here. So my hope is <clears throat> that my opponent would maybe try to contest this here because there's less power in it. And then not have enough mana to stop me from stealing this lane with my bigger Kakoba. My opponent decides to play a 4-4-4-4-4 four, 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 and it's a 5-5-5. Five, five, five. With the hero bonus. Note that this also means with their nurture, or for that matter with their sneezer shroom, they can tie me over here so neither of us moves. And I decided that's fine and I played the big guy over here on the left as planned. So over here I'm beating my opponent by two. They've already used up their hero power so they can't, from what I can see, get plus two here. Obviously they might have a card in hand that provides it. But they didn't. They had Kitsune. So this is the overstatted 2-drop that makes each player draw a card. And <clears throat> the point of this is that her strong stat is Desert, and I need Desert to move. And she provides just enough water that in her zone where she has water, she can move. So she actually powered through my Kakoba for just 2 mana and got to move here and stop me from moving. It was an incredible turn for my opponent. So I still got to move over here on the hero side, negating the advantage of the Sneezer Shroom, and finally watching it go away, but at the end of the day, we're still tired and I wasn't able to get ahead. However, watch what happens. The turn ends and boop, cards fly into the reserve and the reserve is full and my opponent has to throw cards away again. Had my opponent played Nurture a round ago, she, or two rounds ago, she would have, you know, thrown away one fewer card last time. So she might still be throwing away two cards this time if she hadn't played anything from the reserve this time either. But again, we can see how this sitting around in the reserve takes up that precious reserve slot, causing my opponent to fall further behind. And you'll notice if you look at the card advantage situation, my opponent has one card in hand and two in the reserve after discard. I have two in hand and two in the reserve. So I actually have card advantage just because of how many things my opponent is throwing out of the reserve. In this case, they actually chose to throw away their nurture card. They could have played for one free leftover mana turns ago. And because they didn't do that, not only did they have to throw away another card, but they ended up throwing away that card itself and lost the potential for that value. So that extra space that they could have blocked from me would have been completely free. It would have cost them nothing because they had the mana sitting around. And not only would it have cost them nothing, but it would have actually gained them card advantage, having to throw away fewer cards from the reserve. Okay, so now my opponent, we're tied, feels a bit desperate, and they decide not to actually get mana. And I think I'm... Oh, hang on, I might have missed it. I think this turn they also decided not to get mana, and then... They just, or previous turn, and then this turn they don't get mana again. So now when I discard a card for mana, I actually have a mana advantage of two, and we're equal on cards. So you can see that my opponent, in order to keep card advantage or card parity with me, had to throw away two mana. 
and this is the round where I'm starting off with two tokens and they have nothing. Now what happens this round is actually kind of insane. So they play a Sneezer Shroom, which is, you know, innocent enough. And it's a 2-2-2, the gain's anchored. Fine. I'm thinking, okay, this is going to be amazing. I've got the tokens out. I've got a mana advantage. Let's go. So I drop out the Ordis Spy. I throw away their big card. It's a bit understated. It's a two for three. But I figure, like, you know, I've got the tokens here. I've got the mana advantage. I'm going to be fine. My opponent draws out their Kitsune here. So, again, very relevant. Their highest stat is Desert, which is what we both need to move. And I just sort of casually put out this guy. This big chonker. 5-5 five, five for three. <clears throat> My opponent has only two mana left. I'm thinking, hey, you know, I might be about to win this game. My opponent plays Meditation Training. Which does absolutely nothing. So they just anchor one of their cards. They anchor this Kitsune. I think, okay, the game is, uh, is pretty much over. I don't even need to play this Monolith Rune Scribe. I'm already winning in both lanes. My opponent's out of mana. This is it. We have arrived. So we pass. And I move into both territories. So I've won both lanes. Next round, all I have to do is move either lane. And that'll be the game. So we both draw some cards, we both uh, put some mana down. I just need to pile drive one lane, get it to move. I've got this thing here still that can get a bunch of stats. I feel great about it. So I decided to drop out Joan of Arc. It's a little weird committing all this mana, but my thinking is that I need three characters on the board for this to get the boosts. And you know, if I somehow fail to move, um, then I'll get the, the, the big pile of tokens for the following round. And notice that over here I need forest to move, and this Kitsune doesn't have any forest, so I'm actually contesting this lane with my token. I'm contesting this lane with Joan. I've still got a pack of four stats waiting in reserve. You know, this is going to be just totally fine. So she has both of us draw a card. I put out my big gun over here to cement it, so now my opponent um, needs to somehow come up with three forest to stop me from moving i could have put it over here oh hang on a second what did i oh oh oh! i played my spy instead of playing my kakoba right okay the thinking is that i've got this and then i still can spend you know two mana to play this where needed and i'm contesting this lane with the forest however my opponent dropped a nurture so giving a boost over here. And I thought, well, how can this possibly matter? You're still behind on forest. You've only got three mana left. So I just dropped a couple more stats here. Thinking this was it. And then my opponent dropped this guy, which has five forest for three mana. The drawback is that the opponent draws a card. So my opponent gave me a card for this. But they actually beat me on forest and desert. So they're moving here. I'm not. I just did not expect this amount of stats for three mana. But everything kind of worked out for my opponent here because now I kind of left this lane alone. They move in this lane and in this one. So now, even though uh, this round was such a situation where I had to just move once and my opponent couldn't even win, I, I just had to win one lane. I actually lost both lanes and now we're going into the next round tied. Now the good news is that notice again, my opponent's reserve just fills up. They have to throw away a bunch of cards. For the first time this game, I also have to throw away a card, but it's Joan, and we're going to obviously have our final round here, so I don't mind throwing away a two-stat card that costs five mana because the future reward is irrelevant here. My opponent, meanwhile, has to throw away 60% of their cards, and I still have cards in hand. So it is, it is basically tied up here. I just thought it was really impressive that in the previous turn, my opponent beat me in both lanes out of nowhere and brought the game state to this. However, because of all these card advantage issues, because my opponent is mana behind in the final round, it would, it would have been extremely difficult for my opponent to win. So I get my extra tokens from my hero power and from my landmark. I had the two in each lane from Joan. So everything's online. We've got, you know, this guy for huge stats. I decided to play this because I could. I just wanted to, you know, see where my opponent was going to put all their cards and my opponent actually didn't have a card to play here. So at this point, I'm beating in both lanes. And I did have the charge. 
to win everything if needed but i decided not to play that we just casually played a little 222 here and if my opponent had some sort of contest with this final thing i would have had the overpowered charge to finish it up as it is i did not want to play the bad manner charge so i passed and then both my tokens move and the game ended thank you so much for watching i hope you enjoyed it please like and or subscribe i'll see you again soon take care